I'm back. This is like a read aloud bonanza. All right, my friends, I am reading chapter four of Blood on the River. Still in my top five favorite books ever. All right, we left off. Remember, the Indians came with all of those supplies that they so desperately needed. And remember, uh, Captain Smith knows that he cannot trade any weapons with the Indians. So here we go. Chapter 14 is 105, guys. Captain Newport does not return in October with new supplies. This could be a problem. But instead of being hungrier, we have finally gotten through the sickness and we are healthy again. Okay. Threading. They received a lot of rain, right? And what was the water tasting like? Remember Samuel was like, it was as sweet. It was fresh. And now the sickness has gone away. The tribes who are our friends must have convinced our enemies to stop attacking us. And it is no longer dangerous to leave the fort to hunt or to fish. We have a pitiful harvest of wheat and vegetables from our gardens. Pitiful. Not good. Think about it. Why is the harvest bad? It's not because of the soil. Something's not right. But the Indians often bring us food from their own harvest to trade. The air is filled with birds flying south for the winter. And it's easier to shoot enough for a meal. We have more rain and the river water is good to drink. Captain Smith has been put in charge of the trading with the Indians. If we ever run short of corn or meat, he takes a few men and some beads and copper for trading and sails off in the shallop for a few days to visit some of the Indian villages. They always come back with the shallop full of supplies. Captain Smith is also in charge of getting houses built for all of us. With the weather turning colder, we can't keep sleeping in our rotting tents. He sets for us the goal of houses for everyone and cheers us on. We work hard together. Captain Smith always working the hardest. With some felling trees, some splitting wood for the clapboard, some cutting needs, cutting reeds for the thatch. So he was right in there with them, working just as hard as they were. With use shaped timbers to frame the houses, or we use shaped timbers to frame the houses. And the carpenters teach us how to weave sticks together to make mesh. Then coat the mesh with a mixture of river clay and straw to make a wattle and daub the walls. Kind of fill in the cracks. We bundle the reeds to make thatched roofs. I have never helped to build a house before, and it makes me proud to see the work. I see what Captain Smith meant about us needing to stand on many legs to survive. We have to work together. I would never be able to build a house all by myself. Some of the gentlemen work hard with us too until their hands are rough as commoners' hands. By the time the weather turns cold, we have put up warm, dry houses for everyone, even the servants. In early December, Captain Smith chooses nine men to sail with him in the shallop up the Chicomi River. They are hoping to find the passage to the Pacific Ocean and the Orient, and they think this is the way to go. When I ask Captain Smith why this passage to the Pacific is so important, he explains to it to me. The nobles in England want spices and silks and ivory. The best place to get them is in the Orient. China and India. Between England and the and the Orient going east over land are the Ottoman Turks. The Turks gladly sell us all the Chinese silks and the Indian spices we want. They buy it for nothing and then they sell it to us for bags of gold. If we could find a way to the Orient over the ocean going west, 
we can skip the Turks altogether. And that would make the Virginia Company investors very happy and very rich. Captain Smith and his men leave on a frosty morning, and we all wish them well. Once Captain Smith is gone, though, the gentlemen stop working, and even the common men shrink. Shirk, excuse me. Shirk, their chores. That means they're suddenly forgetting to do them. If it wasn't for us servants, the food wouldn't get cooked, the water wouldn't get toted, and the wood wouldn't get chopped for the fires. One cold morning in mid-December, Richard and I are working with the embers that are all that's left of our cabin's fire, trying to bring them to flame. Richard sprinkles dry moss on the embers, and I blow onto them softly. At the first hint of flame, we add twigs. It feels good to be cooperating with Richard and to be his friend. Come on, fire, Richard coaxes. I rub my hands together to warm them. It was Abram and Henry's turn to feed the fire during the night. But they, just like everyone else, don't think much of chores these days. So they're, they're breaking that bond. They're, they're not working together. So there's going to be effects because of that. The twigs catch and we add some bigger chips of wood and keep blowing and soon we have a good fire going. I cough up smoke. We don't have a proper hearth with a chimney like Mum and I used to have in our cottage. This is just a circle of stones on our dirt floor and to let the smoke out there is a hole at the top of the eaves. Our cabin is always smoky. It doesn't even have any windows and it has begun to leak in heavy rains, but is still a lot better than that rotting tent. Within minutes, there is a voice at the door. We need some embers, comes the demand. Richard and I look at each other. Every morning, it's the same. As soon as anyone sees smoke coming from our cabin, they send someone for embers, because they all let their fires go completely out during the night. I open the door and find Master Coughs dressed in his thick wool cossack, but looking rather blue-lipped from cold. I take his spoon, fish out an ember from our fire, and send him on his way. He doesn't even thank me. I think they'd freeze if we didn't have if they didn't have us around. And starve, said Richard. Next comes Master Halgrave, and then Master Frith, and then Nathaniel who has become a soldier, asking for an emperor for the soldier's cabin. Look how disciplined our soldiers are, Richard says, after Nathan leaves. So in other words, making fun of them too. Richard puts an ember into a pan to take to Reverend Hunt in case his fire too has gone out. I go to see if anyone has bothered to start the hominy in the big communal, communal cooking pot. Guys, they used to have like a big pot in the center of their fort where everyone would eat out of. Yes, it sounds disgusting. I hear one of the guards yell out, It is the shallop returned. Hello, explorers. Have you found the passage to India? Captain Smith must be back. I rush to the fort gates. Six men come trailing in. They are tired, dragging their muskets as they walk. There is not a smile among them, and Captain Smith isn't with them. They come to the communal cook fire to warm themselves. There, Abram is stirring the big pot, of, big pot of hominy, a porridge we make from coarse ground, corn. The rest of us gather around. We listen as they give their support, a report. The river had become too narrow to explore with the shallop. Captain Smith went off with two men, Jeb Robinson and Thomas Emery, to find, the Indian, to find an Indian guide and a canoe. He did not return. Indians captured one of their men, George Casson. The last they saw of him, he was tied to a stake with a fire being built around him. They were glad to escape with their lives. I listened, my heart sinking lower and lower. Has Captain Smith been captured by the Indians as well? Has he? Has he been killed? 
Abram scoops the hominy into the mess pots, but I don't want to eat. I leave the fort and go down to the riverbank. There was a, a frost last night, and all the bare branches are coated with white and are sparkling. I walk along the river a little way and then sit down on a jumble of tree roots and look across the dark river. What will happen to me now? I have seen how Henry and Abram have been treated since Master Wingfield was put under arrest. It is as if they were suddenly declared every gentleman's servant, always washing this one's stockings, fetching that one's firewood. President Radcliffe sometimes puts them on double watch shifts so that they get no rest and they go around red-eyed and bad-tempered. But being overworked would not be the worst of it, no. The worst would be losing someone I have grown to trust and care about. I pick up a small stone and throw it, side-armed, making it skip across the water. Five skips. Richard and I should have a contest. I am suddenly feeling, suddenly very grateful that Richard is now my ally, not my enemy. Reverend Hunt, too. I am thankful he is still with us. Without the two of them, I would have no one to, sh to care whether, I would have no one that would care whether I lived or died. In London, it was easy to survive on my own, rummaging in a garbage for my meals. Here, it is better to have a few people to stick up for you and to make sure you get your food rations. More legs to stand on, Captain Smith would say. I hear crunching, footsteps in the frozen dead leaves covering the ground. It is Richard. He is carrying my bowl and spoon. He hands me the steaming bowl of hominy and sits next to me. Thank you, I say. I am very hungry now. It would have been miserable to go all day without breakfast. He nods and wraps his arms around his knees and rests his chin on them. Maybe, maybe he will still come back, he says. Maybe. When my bowl is empty, I pick up a flat stone. How many skips can you make, I ask. Richard grins. More than you, that's for sure. We gather stones and a contest is on. The letter comes just before Christmas. Three Indian messengers bring it to the fort gates, and I rejoice to see Captain Smith's handwriting. I am well, the letter says. Fire the cannons and a few rounds from your muskets to scare these fellows and give them a handful of beads, a pound of copper, and five hatchets, which I have promised to give them. I run to tell Reverend Hunt and Richard. He is with the Padumkis, I exclaimed. They are one of the friendly tribes. I see he still has his paper and quill with him, he says, Reverend Hunt. He must still be writing our story, I say, beaming. Just after New Year, 1608, Richard goes out before me to start the cook pot of harmony, harmony for our communal breakfast. He comes back, not five minutes later, his face white as linen. It's gone, he whispers. The corn, it's all gone. What do you mean it's gone, I ask. Yesterday there was plenty, enough for two weeks at least. Richard shakes his head. I looked for the barrel of the smoked meat too, and the baskets of dried oysters, gone. I feel the blood drain from my face. Are the natives now stealing our food instead of bringing it to us? Or have the raccoons and foxes gotten into our stores? But we had men on guard all night. I run out of the cabin to see for myself. Richard is right. Our food is gone. Then I notice something else. The fort is eerily quiet. There is hardly anyone around. The only activity is two laborers chopping firewood and a soldier sitting outside the cabin cleaning his musket. The sun is already up and the gentlemen should have been grumbling for their breakfast. The day is quite cold with a pale winter sun, and yet not a single gentleman has come to our cabin to ask for an ember. Where are they? I demand, fear growing in the pit of my stomach. Who? Richard asked. The gentleman. It's getting good. Remember, thread, my friends.